get a view as I've got Zoltan Estevan here. He's the author of The Transhumanist Wager. He's also a documentary maker. Has been uh, worked for National Geographic. He's worked with Huffington Post, uh, New York Times, I believe, and is doing a column on transhumanism. And so, yeah, um, would you like to introduce yourself and what projects you're involved in at the moment? Sure, and thanks, Adam, for having me on your show. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I'm uh, as you said, I'm the author of the the Transhumanist Wager. It's a, a novel, life ex about life extension, longevity, science, and transhumanism. And um, I got some other exciting things recently going on. I've just started blogging for the Huffington Post and Psychology Today, and they're both um, transhuman oriented blogs. And so they're specifically uh, stories about longevity, uh, transhumanism, and life extension science and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Excellent. No worries. Okay. Well, um, well, tell us about the impetus for writing this book. I mean, what got you involved in the the interest? What got you interested in the idea of transhumanism? Well, um, so I, I think I about twenty years ago uh, had discovered transhumanism, transhumanism just through various science fiction films and stuff like that. But then when I got to college, I had read um, in a magazine. A story on cryonics and it really was the very first introduction to living you know perhaps indefinitely and I think once I read that article it was in Time magazine it really just put a, a light on in my head and I was never really quite the same and so I spent the next five ten years studying about it thinking about it dreaming about it and um, you know I, 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 would, I was, would say I was an active transhumanist at that point and then uh, I started getting the idea that, well I'd like to put some of my ideas uh, to paper and I'd been a journalist at that time um, for the National Geographic Channel about uh, five years and was all over the world. Hmm. And uh, had a couple, I was doing a lot of war correspondence, had a couple close calls, uh, a couple hmm. almost landmine incidents. And it just, it, it scared me enough to get me really wanting to work more in, in the transhuman field and actually make it so that <laughs> nothing could ever happen to me and, the, you know, and to those that I loved. And um, hmm. so I decided to put my, uh, all my thoughts into this novel. It took about four full years to write. Um, and uh, I was lucky I even got that kind of space of time to do it. And uh, I started at 36, I just turned 40, and uh, the novel came out about four or five months ago. Mm -hmm. Well, it's nothing like this period of time that we're living in. It's quite extraordinary. I mean, yeah, it's kind of a lot of things are happening for the first time, right? I mean, a lot of new technologies are really opening doors to what we haven't seen before. Um, you know, everybody who's lived so far who's not still alive has died um, but that may not be necessarily the rule in the future uh, if, if we treat biology as um, more like a machine and we can sort of um, have interventions to help us uh, sort of live for long periods of time I think it's a very exciting thing prospect to look at um, I did uh, at the start of your book it's very visceral the way that you uh, introduce the book with um, uh, what's his name, the captain who's on the ship and he he, he gets uh, yeah, tossed over nice. by a massive yeah. like, uh, wave and thinks, oh no, is this the end, right? Yeah, it's it's a really, really interesting way. It's a very captivating way to start a, a book, the way you've introduced the characters there. Well, yeah, thanks. And you know, that, that story is um, quite, uh, you know, I, one of the things I didn't mention in my, uh, in my little introduction myself is that I actually left on a sailboat at age 21. And, uh, you know, first third of the book is, uh, I don't want to say autobiographical, but it, it does follow very closely to some of the things that have happened to me. The landmine incident uh, that convinces Jethro to really dedicate his life to transhumanism was a very similar incident that happened in my life and when I was in um, Vietnam and um, for the National Geographic Channel. And uh, so I had... Uh, a couple of close things, but the actual sailing thing—I actually did go through a death roll um, on a on a sail trip. Um, uh, it was actually a passage from the Kingdom of Tonga to Fiji, and I just somehow got caught in a bad storm, and a rogue wave hit me and just did the full tip over thing. And while it wasn't as dramatic, of course, in the book, and certainly the waves were not that big, it was enough where um, you know the boat was upside down. Uh, I you lost. You didn't lose so your cheat. You didn't lose your cheek. Yeah. But. <laughs> I didn't lose, I didn't, it wasn't that dramatic, but I, I certainly was cut up, I was bruised all over, and crazy things happened. In fact, I had a Clorox bottle explode inside the boat from the rocking, and that was the scariest thing, because I actually couldn't breathe, so I had to get outside, and of course, outside was basically underwater, so it was a, it was a kind of a nightmare scenario, but, so that, that part of the story actually has a, a kind of a lot of uh, 
truth to it. And uh, mm. so, uh, well, I guess that was, that's what made it so um, visceral and real when I was reading it. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I mean, like, um, what do you think? Like, do you think that we have a chance? I mean, are we living in an age where we can expect technologies like? Um, uh, radical rejuvenation therapy to make a big difference in the in in our lifetime, or is it something that we can expect our children or our um, children's children to to have? Well, so I'm I'm definitely a believer that it's going to happen in our lifetime. I, I'm I'm quite certain of it. I I tend to think that if it if there's something to happen, it's going to come from either um, some kind of disruption to civilization you know, from the outside and asteroids, something like that, but more likely internal conflict war, something catastrophic in that sense, or just as I point out in my book, I'm really also afraid that, um, you know, the planet that's still quite religious, maybe there will be parties that will uh, rise up and just say, you know, this is not the path we want the human race to take, uh, and which would be very, very disappointing for me. So those are, I think it will definitely happen. And I think, you know, if I can live to age 70, about 30 more years, I'm going to be right on the cusp of that the, that envelope where I can kind of make it uh, mm -hmm. I into uh, an indefinite or at least a lifespan that goes from 100 to potentially 150, 200. And then once you get there, it's, you're probably home free. Mm. I, uh, I also think that once artificial intelligence um, <laughs> comes into the picture and helps um, humanity with sciences mm. and things like that, it might be you know, a thousand times smarter than us in 10, 15 years. Who knows? Mm -hmm. um, that's another factor that can actually accelerate how fast we can get to a point when um, uh, indefinite lifespans become the co the norm. Mm -hmm. And so I'm definitely a firm believer. I know there's a lot of naysayers out there, but uh, oh, I'm an certainly are. Oh, look, um, it's, it's it's an interesting concept. But I mean, even among the nay naysayers, uh, uh, there is um. You know, some people taking it seriously, even if you believe that there's a small chance of something like a singularity or like um, a high impact technology like uh, nanotech or biotech really taking off and making a big difference. Even if you apply just a small likelihood to something like that happening, the expected outcome or the expected utility, the impact is so huge, you should factor that into the equation as well and not just treat it as just any old low probability event on the horizon. It's a low probability, high impact event, which is quite different. Um, yeah. So anyway, like a, I really like the title of this book. It's called the Transhumanist Wager. Any reference to the to Pascal's wager there? Well, yes, of course. And uh, you know, I mean, Pascal's wager was such a dominant theme, um, you know, a few centuries back. Yeah. And I think it's, I think most everybody knows it. And so I've been trying uh, to play off that. Because the it seems like to me that the chairs in the you know, in the musical game have changed. We now, with um, science improving uh, so rapidly as well as technology, we can now uh, take that uh, I guess the position of you know life given by some deity and give it to ourselves. And so that's why I think now is actually the the wager really is a transhumanist one, whereas we can make that choice to bring those kind of. Um, gifts, you know, life extension and indefinite lifespans to ourselves. And I think, uh, as I've said in a few of my speeches, um, I think every single one of us faces a transhumanist wager in our lives. It's not necessarily the one in the book, but it's how far will we go and how far do we want to go to bring those kind of changes to our, our, our essence, our being ourselves and stuff like that. And, uh, of course, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm ready to, you know, go as far as we can go to uh, evolve into as, as I guess, as strong, as powerful creatures as we can become. Mm. Yeah, well, one of the things about the rest of space is it's a vacuum. Um, it looks as though it's pretty harsh <laughs> out there. Uh, if we're to survive, um, it may may really, really require us to radically transform our um, substrate, our biology, um, as Randall Kuhne likes to say. Um, substrate independence minds. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Now he's a, he's awesome. He's also come to Australia and spoken at one of my conferences. Uh, so look, um, why is this important to think about now? I mean, the transhumanist movement has sort of crept along during the early '90s and you know, through to the end of like close to 2000, got a bit like more popular in the 2000s, and now seems to be gaining a lot of traction in books, um, in movies 
in um, well, Inferno is a recent book that references the board, uh, the right. Humanity Plus organization on which I'm on the board of, and what's the other one? Like uh, it's been referenced in Mass Effect, the, one of the most popular um, like games out there. Um, next year, there's going to be a whole movie on the singularity. It's, it's it's really getting attention these days. Why? What? Why do you think that is? Well, I think for there, there's two there's two things. The first is that an entire younger generation is coming up, being brought up with technology, and so these concepts to them are no longer um, science fiction. They've kind of been, uh, you know, just it's been bred into them from the very start. And the other thing is I think it's it's becoming reality. A lot of these ideas that even in the 90s were still pretty far-fetched are now starting to really make um, inroads. And I, I feel that between those two factors, um, an entire new uh, interpretation from a cultural standpoint is needed. And we can start to say, wow, 20 years is not really that long to talk about having indefinite longevity, you know, longevity and stuff like that, or to talk about having an artificial intelligence that's actually uh, superior in many ways to the, the human being. So these are no longer uh, movie, you know, concepts we're just going to be seeing in movies. These are things that we will be seeing very soon that, uh, uh, I mean, virtually all of us will probably be seeing it. So uh, mm. I think it's become not just uh, some fable far out there in the future, but um, something that we can almost touch, we can almost grasp, that we know scientists around the world are working on, and that we know it's really now just a matter of time. I think before, there was always this idea, well, it might happen or it might not. And now, there's really no question whether it's, a lot of this stuff is going to happen. It's really a question of when now. And I think that's a very different mindset than we could have even had in the 1990s. Yeah, sure. It's, it is, it's impressive how far science and technology has gone in um, examining a body and understanding how it works and the social understanding of like what's possible with with tech with biotech and things um, and even some large companies have taken some serious interest I mean like this whole Google Calico uh, project uh, like I, I've actually gone through and interviewed a series of transhumanists on their impressions about um, not only the Google Cal Calico thing, but um, also the, uh, you know, what their impressions are of the general media performance in transhumanism and, and societal responses. It's been quite interesting. It, you're right, it is a, um, a very interesting uh, phenomenon mm. in the media. Um, but, um, so, you're, you're particularly interested in um, life extension or rejuvenation therapy. Um, you obviously are aware of Orby de Grey's work, right? Oh yeah, yeah. In fact, we had a lunch together yes. uh, a month ago, and I'm very familiar with it. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, so, yeah, what 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 form of longevity? Uh, what form of um, uh, health expan extension uh, technology do you think will come first? So I, I'm a big this is a little bit far out, but I'm a big proponent of artificial intelligence showing up here in the next 10 to 15 years. Sure. And I'm a, I'm a firm believer that that will, to some extent, rewrite. It's only going to take a few years mm. for something that's smarter than ourselves to rewrite many types of science books, many types of... Uh, in fact, I've said this in philosophy, that the entire field of philosophy could be rewritten in a few years because they'll probably have new ideas that are so much... Um, more intelligent than ourselves. I expect biology. I expect uh, I expect uh, life extension science to exponentially shoot up once that happens. I'm a little bit afraid of such an event. I think it, it's a, it's a bit dangerous to have a uh, something else smarter than ourselves out there. Hmm. Yet at the same time, I, I'm what I'm hoping for is that people will be able to connect biology to machines much better in 15 hmm. years, hmm. and that when those two worlds meet. We will be able to jump into them, or out, um, or you know, them into us. However, it'll happen. Mm -hmm. And the, I'm one of those people that I'm really excited about the uploading concept, mm -hmm. um, as opposed to using biology necessarily mm -hmm. to try to live longer. Now, I completely support all the field, mm -hmm. um, but um, as you talked about, like most of the space is a vacuum. What I really look forward to is leaving the flesh behind 
and trying to go into something that's uh, so either entirely on the flesh. Entire, yes. Yeah, entire da data. And you, you, in my book, there's quite a few references that the, the you know the human flesh is just a coffin. I, it's it's a wonderful system for you know how it's done so far in evolution. But I think the next step of evolution is not going to necessarily have um, something made necessarily of carbon and stuff like that. It could be something uh, uh, quite different. And so I'm uh, I'm hoping that in the next 20 to 30 years we will start making a transition into those. Uh, other types of things. That'll be truly a transhuman entity. That's, at that, point. that will be a very post-human. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it'll be post-human. <laughs> um, and um, and so that's where I would like to spend most of my time thinking about and also yes. uh, aspiring to. That said, um, I know that that also might be more unrealistic than some of the rejuvenation type of techniques that uh, you know, Sands and some of the other people, uh, other organizations are working on. I think um, it's very important that all avenues of transhumanist uh, um, research move forward because it's very difficult to know what hangups we're going to hit along the way. Mm -hmm. Just because, uh, you know, it's one way seems better. I'm a pretty firm believer that all ways should be happening at the same time. And then later, as we get down that road, we'll choose the ones that are best for us. Mm -hmm. But it'll be certainly nice to have all the different uh, avenues of uh, research uh, going. Maybe maybe the best way will be to keep the human body and just make it so that it can live thousands of years. But uh, that seems unlikely. But uh, mm -hmm. I certainly would not want the research to stop on that end. I, I yeah, I'd certainly like to have both avenues of research, like you say, forking research in uh, potential high impact areas for sure is a really good thing. I wouldn't dismiss um, doing basic fundamental research on just physics and biology because there may be things that we haven't actually thought of yet. Um, but yeah, you're right. Uh, it's a it's a strange, strange time to be alive. I mean, yeah, a lot of what has uh, I guess prevented us from doing fundamental research on aging is possibly this existential angst of, of, of death and, you know, this, what we do, we deny deny to ourselves that um, this is actually going to happen or that it's a bad thing and that sort of cover-up sort of stops us from any impetus in trying to, to sort of kick against the pricks. But um, nowadays we have this sort of weird existential angst of what's going to happen really in the future once we have these radically changing technologies. I mean, look, the universe has been around for 30.5 billion years, the Earth for about 4 billion, um, single cell life maybe for 1.5 billion, multi-celled for like half a billion or something like that, and now here we are, you know, these like um, hyper apes that have just suddenly worked out science and you know these newcomers on the the universal block so to speak are, are developing technologies so that just completely rewrite what evolution has taken built like you know hundreds of millions of years to do it's kind of strange oh it, it's <laughs> bizarre even even you know my sometimes my wife just kind of looks at me and she's like wow <laughs> what, are you, what, what are you talking about? And what am I married even I to? Have to say, yeah, even I have to say the same thing. I wake up and think this is, this is you know, this is really far out there. But um, is it any further out there than you and I talking on Skype and you're in a, you know, you're in a different continent? Mm -hmm. It's like, how is this happening? Well, you know, it's not magic anymore. It's just no. simply science. And there are people that have figured it out. And, and I think we're going to figure out the same thing when we... Um, perhaps just do this through our minds or whatever it will be in 15, 20 years. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it, it's, it, it is strange because it has taken so long to get here, but I, I suppose all J, J curves in, um, in science sort of are the, the same way where they, once they start going up, they're just, they go. Yeah, in, in academia, there seems to be a bias against um, trying to be wrong, <laughs> a bias against um, being wrong, not trying to be wrong. Um, people don't like to make uh, predictions or don't like to make speculations, especially of the kind that radically changes what it means to be human or, you know, radically means a big change for status quo. Um, and so we don't have large international universities trumpeting the possibilities of the future that um, some futurists do. But um, do you think that might change? I, I hope so. <clears throat> I hope so. You know, I would, I would want... In an ideal situation, and I was just speaking with somebody about this on the phone, I thought in an ideal situation we would have so much more of the human population um, dedicating resources, like just if everyone dedicated a few percent of their resources to longevity, 
to uh, science, to the betterment of, of society and themselves, we would be so much better off. <clears throat> As I you know, wrote in my Psychology uh, Today blog, um, there's about $400 trillion of wealth out there, maybe 600 who knows. But if we just took about $50 billion, we could probably solve the, uh, the life extension or the, the mortality problem within about 10 years. And um, unfortunately, uh, for some reason, society doesn't want to dedicate 1% of its net worth, uh, civilization doesn't want to, to this, this overwhelming problem, which is we're going to die. And, uh, and I find it uh, offended asinine. I wish that um, we would uh, come together and say, hey, we can overcome this. It, it's not necessarily going to change anyone's cultural beliefs uh, in some massively radical way. It just means simply we can, you know, uh, live much longer and then decide uh, along the way how we want to be as a, as a civilization, as societies and stuff like that. Hmm. Well, back to the transhumanist wager then. Um... What, are, what do you want people to take away from reading this book? Is it like, will they get knowledge? Will they get um, impetus? Will they get inspired? What do you so, have? My, my, my main goal with The Transhumanist Wager was to write a novel that, and, and I believe very strongly in using art as a, a vehicle to get people to think new thoughts, to open themselves to new ideas. And I wanted The Transhumanist Wager to let everyone know that it, it's, it's really themselves that face the transhumanist wager, and it's themselves that need to decide how far do do I want to go to um, become a, a, a different type of entity, you know, to move beyond what I was uh, given, you know, just on here right now. And and I hope when they read it, they'll take that away and say, yes, I want to go this far, or I, I wouldn't cut off my arms, but I would, uh, you know, maybe put some chips in my head. You know, I want everyone to type type a kind of Take some time and say, how far would they go to becoming a post-human or a transhuman entity? Mm -hmm. And I think if everyone did that, it would be much, uh, it would be very healthy because first off, just even thinking about these concepts gets people a bit more comfortable, a bit more um, familiar with them. I think right now most people are, they know technology's come, they use their, their cell phones, but they don't really think, see, of it, see it in a way that is very fundamentally different than who they were 20 years ago or something. Mm. Where, as I see it as, wow, you know, even a cell phone is a, quite a dramatic increase in our capacity for transfer of information and stuff like that. And I'd like um, people to read my novel and say, well, actually what's happening is a very significant change, not just in my own person, but in the species as a whole. And can, there, can I do something to accelerate that? Because in general, technology and science has improved the lives of the, the world's population, and therefore it seems like it's a good thing. So we should perhaps try to do that more, <laughs> use more science and technology to improve the world. And so I'm hoping that my novel would actually go into the mainstream and get people thinking about things like that. And, you know, I, I put out a whole philosophy out there and it, it's quite aggressive. Mm. Um, it, it's designed to yeah. get people to, you know, hopefully embrace using technology and science to essentially upgrade themselves from being a human being to something transhuman. Right, okay, yeah, so I mean like the book seems to have received some interesting reviews, some have compared it to Anne Rain's novel Atlas Shrugged, do you think that's a fair comparison? Yeah, I, I absolutely do think it's a fair comparison because there, there are so many similarities between um, her, her book and my book, um, in, in the sense of they both present entire comprehensive philosophies and also in the sense that there's a group of people that are being um, kind of uh, condemned for their sets of ideas and the you know there are a small group of people but they're kind of the inventors they're kind of the people that make stuff happen in the world and in the, my book the same thing happens and so they withdraw and in Atlas Shrugged they go to John's you know uh, God's, uh, little sanctuary and in my book they go to Transhumania a seasteading city so there's similarities like that However, you know, objectivism and my philosophy in the book, which is TAP or teleological egocentric functionalism, are quite different. I'm, my philosophies are certainly more um, Nietzschean, more aggressive, and, and, and stuff like that. But yeah, there's a lot of similarities, and I've been, uh, it's, it's, it's nice to be compared to, you know, Atlas Shrugged is one of the best-selling novels of all time, so it, it's very nice to be compared to that. But at the same time, they are quite different books, and I don't think Anne Rand would approve of uh, the transhumanist wager. 
Uh, perhaps not. Well, how did um? Well, I guess Nietzsche would have. Uh, you mentioned Nietzsche. How did he influence your thinking? And, and how does so, it, you know, Why do you think that relates to transhumanism? Well, I, I just think one of my central problems with where we are right now is that I feel. You know, with 95% of the world still believing in formal religion, that they have slowed the evolution of the species to a point when, you know, it's quite dramatic. It's hard to say where we'd have been if a thousand years ago we would have dropped religion. You know, I think at least in the last century, it's it would be much more important to let go of some of these I, cultural beliefs, uh, heritage beliefs, and stuff like that, and say, you know, because a lot of them are anti-science. A lot of them are in the way of progress and you know there's there's really when you tell someone you want to live forever you're like well that defeats the whole purpose of kind of what the bible is for so there's there's conflict there and i feel that if we could leave a lot of that if we could uh get our uh, civilization to be far less religious and more believing in the rationality reason the potentiality of science we would much more quickly be able to achieve the uh, goals of transhumanism and you know, the main point of the transhumanist wager is of a single man who wants to live indefinitely. He does not want to die. And I feel like you and I, we're sort of at that, we're sort of in that generation where it's really iffy for us. We're not sure we're going to make it. It might be the generation after us that actually gets to live indefinitely. And I don't like that idea. And that's why I have, you know, I, I was always attracted to Nietzsche, but that's why, and, and you know, Nietzsche is quite aggressive. He's uh, he doesn't really take any uh, no for an answer. He just simply has very aggressive philosophies, and he feels that you should overcome whatever you need to do to get to your aims. Um, and you know that does that mean putting, other people as well? It, it it does in many ways. I don't know if Nietzsche would agree with that. Certainly, um, you know Jethro Knights in my book has said something like that. Um, I don't think he wants that, uh, not in any way. However, at, there comes a point when it's his life or other people's life on the line, then one must make that decision. And I think Nietzsche would probably agree with that as well. Um, now, that's where a lot of the controversy in the book gets started, is how far do you go to achieve your goals of you know, uh, immortality and stuff like that? Do you walk over other people's lives to do so? And um, so, you know, I'm uh, certainly not entirely aligned with Jethro. I think he goes too far. Mm. However, you know, I wrote the book that way to try to present as mm. strong and as comprehensive of the philosophy as possible, um, especially perhaps with machines and AI coming in 10, 15 years, how the morality of a machine might actually operate. And I think that those, you know, things combined make, uh, you know, put forth this pretty aggressive philosophy that you can find mm -hmm. um, in the book. And very Nietzschean-like, perhaps even... Uh, uh, further than he would go. More Nietzsche than Nietzsche. <laughs> More Nietzsche than Nietzsche, exactly. So what do you think about U U Uberman, or Overman? Do you think that's a reference? Like, it, does that does it, uh, does that play into your philosophy? Or? Yes, yes, I, I, it definitely does. And, you know, I have a, a, a similar type of concept in my book called the Omnipotenter. Basically, that's, you know, the Latin is one who wants to contend for all the power in the universe. That's his goal, to become the ultimate power. The will to and power, the, yeah. Yeah, and, and, and it's, it's, it's a very, yeah, exactly, and it's a dark concept because only one person will be able to really achieve that, although in the book it's, it's, it's said that one person can achieve it, but he would accept a draw. If he could just have an, you know, a draw with everyone else, it would also work, but mm. I, I do think that um, you know, the Uberman or the Omnipotent are very similar concepts where they are striving to get to a place when no one can ever take away the things that are sacred to them take away their their lives, um, take away the things that they cherish. And uh, I think we all in the modern world are afraid sometimes. So, you know, the, the uh, omnipotent or the Uberman hopefully get to a point when they never uh, have to fear anything ever again, and they just have complete uh, security in, um, in, you know, their power. Mm. Well, that's an interesting concept, but it does introduce some interesting elements to, uh, you know, a game condition. We have a look at evolution. It, it's not the same as the uh, the way that we're surviving today, and we know um, well game theory. If you put a lot of agents who have relatively the same amount of resources and relatively the same amount of like abilities and and um, sort of attributes, then like you know it it might be 
okay to have some sort of like tit for tat iterated prisoner's dilemma sort of scenario it might be very different when uh, there's tipping scales met with some people where you know um, Joe Joe blogs down the street has like you know a, a thousand processes in his head and you only have five <laughs> um, right what, 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 how much more how much more would he be able to broaden the gap between you and him with that much more processing power or that much more command of resources or that much more political influence so I mean here's the thing I mean if it, if, if it's not necessarily a cooperative model if it's a greed is good sort of model um, can you see that playing out as being bad for the most people and being good for only one or a few? And yeah, no, and I can. And so, you know, even I, this is where I, I struggle with even some of my own um, ideas in my book is because, um, first off, I, a lot of people ask me, you know, is the elite going to eventually take all this technology and run with it? And the, the fact of the matter is that I don't belong to the elite. I'm not some super rich human being, so I would not belong to that. So I would be very upset if somebody did that. And it's kind of that same question here is, well, what if I was not the one who ended up with all this power, which is, of course, very unlikely. Um, the, the idea is, yes, that's, that's, a very, that's something I disagree with entirely. However, the philosophy um, in itself is not necessarily important whether I agree with it or you agree with it. It's kind of thrown out there. It's just this is the way that the universe operates. Mm. There's going to be somebody at the top of the pyramid. I didn't write the rules. I simply am just telling them as I saw them. And uh, again, like I said, I, I, a lot of people kind of come after me and said, well, this is, you, you know, your book's awful, this and that. But they're not exactly necessarily ideas that I fully embrace or agree with. Mm -hmm. I see the harshness in them. I have a child, a wife, a family. These are not things that go very well together with the ideas. Um, however, I felt like, uh, you know, perhaps the journalist in me, I wanted to do the best reporting job of mm. the structure of the universe that I actually saw and how I, I felt maybe evolution was going to play out. Mm. Um, yeah. And actually, this is when, uh, you know, as I eventually will get into my sequel, I will try to work out some of these questions and hopefully, I, I just don't know if there's going to be a happy ending to it. Maybe... Um, Maybe there really is no happy ending for the vast majority of us here. Uh, again, I don't like that idea. I don't tell like that you idea. Mostly, yeah. yeah, I don't like it at all. But um, mm. again, there are many ideas I don't like, and I, I sometimes have to just succumb to them. Uh, I've had many bad things happen in my life, and that's just how life is. So again, I, I there's a couple, you know, very controversial ideas in the transhumanist wager, mm. and they bother me too. But uh, sometimes I can't work outside of the logic of them, and so I have written it that way just because it seemed the only way for me to do, to be the most uh, honest to myself with the reason that I could uh, find in my brain. And yeah. Uh, yeah. It, it's difficult. It is difficult, and it's perplexing. And this is one of my existential angst that I, I mentioned before. I mean, even during the Enlightenment, when... Um, you know, as, as modernity was kicking in, the, there were arguments between major philosophers. There was um, Kant and Rousseau mm. sort of quarrelling about the the usefulness of all this, and and uh, John Locke who was saying, "Hey, look at all this; it's great." Um, Rousseau said, "Like, um, I've got a quote here." He said. Princes know that all the needs which a people imposes on itself are so many chains with which it assumes. So, so many chains. It's like this, a chain. Um, indeed, what yoke would be imposed of men who need nothing? So, in the end, it may be better off for some people if we didn't actually have technology, if it means their, their demise or their doom. And he also said, what... Well, uh, he also said, uh, what conclusion can be drawn from this paradox so worthy of being born in our time, and what will become of the of virtue once um, once everyone has to get rich at all costs? The ancient political thinkers forever spoke of moles and virtue, ours speak of only commerce and money. And in this um, sort of context, I guess, uh, that could sort of mean just acquisition of resources. <laughs> right. <clears throat> Yeah, no, I mean, these are, I think a lot of the uh, ideas you just 
read about and the ideas even in my book, they, they are ideas that have been going on for generations and, uh, you know, centuries now um, with some of the more modern day philosophers. Because uh, as you point out with game theory, it's not that difficult to figure out a lot of the basics of game theory, but um, actually having coming to conclusive uh, um, right or wrong, yes or no ideas in game theory is very difficult. You know, it's just it, it's hard to actually know that despite some of the logic, whether that would be the best uh, idea, because as human beings, we're, you know, we're not always logical. And uh, as I mentioned, one of the, the points that I really did believe about my book is that it's not just um, written for today. It's written for that time when artificial intelligence actually does enter into the picture. And if we could take the morality of a machine or the ethics of artificial, of an entity that mm. thinks like that, what will it think? It'd probably be much closer to the transhumanist wager than it will be to you and I having this kind of uh, amicable conversation. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> With our little meat monkey hyper brains, right, yeah. Um, well, that's the thing. I mean, the more we understand about the reality of our surroundings, um, the wider, the wider our, um, I guess, the wider we can expand the circle of ethical consideration, as Peter Singer likes to put it, um, the more the the larger the circle, the the more elements we have to think about, and so it requires a lot more intelligence to do that. It may actually be that it may actually be a good move to create like a, maybe a seed AI that works out the problem of ethics and morality. Um, or coherently extrapolates volition or ethics from the sum of like uh, what we want or what we would want if we were really, 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 really smart. Who knows? But um, I'm hoping that like if AI does get booted up before the you know some superhuman gets you know powerful, it will be able to work out ethics in a, a lot more of a, a cohesive way than we have. Not necessarily rule based either, but. Um, it's a difficult question, that one. Perhaps one of the most important questions that we we're facing. Yeah, no, I, I I really do think it is one of the most important questions, and I agree with what you said to just give some seed AI here and there, and and really, it's it's. I, I like to move fast with technology, but that's one area when I think we really need to be as cautious as possible and make sure that we have every safeguard. Um, in place because we as a, as a species we've never actually had to work against something that is more intelligent than us and um, and that really <laughs> that we're so so you know, comfortable being apex predators on this world exactly right? exactly it could be very very uh, different and the vast majority of us will know nothing about the AI anyways we'll know nothing about programming nothing about machines nothing about that hmm. so uh, so much of our us are going to be left completely at the mercy of this so I I, uh, I'm, you know, I have started to some extent looking into how to do my sequel to the book, and it's certainly going to involve AI because the the book ends you're about 60 years into the future from here, and certainly AI has already, you know, been invented to some extent. I don't really explain it, but um, you know, there's mm. there's one mention at the very end that the the rogue Japanese, you know, um, in in the in the fictional sense, have created a super machine, you know, and so. There's all these elements that I can take, and I've been thinking a lot at night uh, on my spare time what it really would mean to have something like that uh, mm. arrive. And I don't mean in the Terminator sense, but I, I'm really looking at the philosophical aspects mm. of it. Mm. Uh, how would it think differently than us? Mm. And um, and it's it's absolutely fascinating. I mean, it's, it's a oh, whole new, is. you know. Well, I mean, uh, like it's it's pretty hard to t try and build into a plot device. Oh, look, I've spoken to science fiction authors before. I've interviewed Verna Vinci and um, uh, Kim Stanley Robinson and a few others. Like, um, And, look, it's it's really difficult to put in the middle centre stage um, an intelligence that is, A, smarter than us, but, B, architecturally completely different, <laughs> right? Um, yeah, how do you build that into a plot device without without turning it into something that people can't relate to? Of course, of course. I, you know, I, I think that's the that's the, what's going to make it. It'll, it'll be, just it'll virtually be a machine, uh, not a machine, but an alien to us. Yeah. It'll be something that we probably won't really fathom at first. And it, you know, I, I love the sci-fi movies. I watch them all day long and stuff. And uh, mm. um, it, it's probably going to be so much more dramatically different than even the you know some of the most out there sci-fi films on when it first relates to us. You know, I just even concepts of. Uh, 
having children or, or marriage, it, it just probably will be like, why, what for? <laughs> you know, what, what would you do that for? <laughs> you know, I mean, things that are at the central, the core of who we, of what we want to do, you know. And um, so I, I find, you know. The children like you, children like making your competitors. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> they grow yeah. up and compete with you, right? <laughs> yeah, so, of course, of course. So it, it's such a different, uh, uh, you know, a different mindset, I suppose. But yeah, I mean, like, I guess better informed choices we make today we need to think about these sorts of things we need to wrestle with these difficult concepts today and let's do it as soon as possible let's do it um, you know with all our vigor and strength because if we leave these these sorts of thinking processes we leave these sorts of ideas to the last minute um, then you know a lot of people are going to be quite uh, displaced and, and that's the least of the problems uh, if we don't have the the thinking um, required the the you know the, the the intelligence or the thinking required to to create the future that we really want, then um, we 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 may just end up with a future that we get instead. Which is yeah, yeah. entirely. In fact, that was you know one that you asked earlier. What was one of the reasons I, I had um, written the the transhumanist wager? And a lot of it, and while I'm totally inspired by transhumanism, a lot of it was to present also a warning. A warning on what can happen if we do not solve um, either religious conflict with technological innovation or just conflict between uh, you know other just all the strat all the technologies and all the science growing so quickly I mean we really are entering a an era when we are growing so much quicker than we ever have and probably massive amounts of us are going to get left behind and not understand virtually anything that's happening I mean, like I said, so few of us even understand the technology that this day and age that's, for example, going into our Skype call. It's, it's, we, we're getting more detached from a lot of the things that are a center piece of our reality. And I think, uh, well, I, I, I love all the benefits of it. I can see there comes a day when it actually becomes a real danger. Mm. And I hope, you know, conversations like we're having now, my book, and just the millions of other people out there that are trying to talk about this, will actually get a message across and say, okay, everyone, this is serious stuff. Let's focus. Let's do this right. And especially let's get some of the governments to pay more attention to how this is going to uh, unfold. And hopefully they'll support it while, uh, you know, while also guiding it down some path that will make it uh, beneficial for society and civilization as a whole. Mm. I find it myself often taking for granted that, um, you know the whole mainstream materialist idea. I, I'm a materialist. I'm a reductive physicalist. Panpsychism might be real. I don't know, but still, it's all physicalism. But a lot of people don't see it that way. You know, a lot of people are just like either intuitive dualists or or um, mysticists, or just don't see the world obeying as you know at least the mind and our intentionality is uh, obeying the rest of the laws of physics that the universe abides by. If they even know that the universe has a law of physics, right? Do you think that it's required to for people to um, have materialist views to make better judgments about the future? Well, I, I think I think it certainly helps, um, but I, I also, you know, I, I think I'm not sure if it's so much what view they have as much as how they go about actually arriving at the view that they have. Mm. You know, one of the central issues in my book is I said that if there was any religion for transhumanists, it's just simply asking the question, why? And I think most people go around their lives completely unaware of anything. They just don't question anything anymore. And I really, you know, I, I, I think that's the great thing about scientists. They go around all day long asking why, mm. you know, why, why, what's the reason? And I wish people would do that because I think if more people did that, more people Ex examine their lives, they would then decide where they stand. They would decide, you know, they'd, they'd probably use reason more to say, well, you know, actually I've been living that way for 15 years, but it doesn't make that much sense. And then they'd start to come to these other conclusions. Because I'm, I'm a believer that if everyone just thinks about it, we're all going to probably arrive at pretty similar conclusions. And that those similar conclusions will be a better path for civilization as a whole. So I do, uh, I, I just think one of the things I really, you know, when I talk to people is just try to say, well, I hope whatever you're doing, you're examining everything that's in front of you, not just taking, as you had said, for granted. 
Because I think when we start taking everything for granted, especially the modern world, we forget how complex, how beautiful it is, but also um, just the, the actual rationality and the actual uh, science and stuff behind it. And so I'm hoping <clears throat> in the future more and more people will kind of come out of their mystical view set and, uh, and say, well, let's think about this. And just even thinking about it is, is a good start for people having a, living better lives and uh, making better informed decisions. Hmm. So, well, I think there might be some, like, you know, future shocks that people will cause people to actually think about these sorts of things, even if they don't think about it now. <coughs> so, like forms of Sputnik moments, perhaps. Um, have you got any ideas of what a possible future shock or Sputnik moment might look like that will inspire people to really think about the, the rapid pace of science mm. and technology? Well... You know, one of the things that I had uh, written about recently in the Huffington Post was about, is it time for a transhumanist Olympics? That was my latest uh, article. And I, I really think if we had something like that, and I had, I had essentially argued saying, well, you know, we criticize all these people for doing drugs and all these athletes, whatever, but why don't we actually have a type, some sporting events that actually include all the technology that is possible, that include any kind of drug you want to do? I mean, people might be run, as I said, 10, 15 years, people might run faster than horses. Um, it, when, if you have events like that, those might be culture changers. Um, have, you know, it's great when you have something like Sputnik, which really, you know, creates, I think the, um, when the machine uh, beat the Kosparov in, in chess, that was also a moment when everyone said, oh, wow, okay, finally that has come. And I think we need more moments like that. I don't know where else they're going to come from. Uh, perhaps the, the driverless car is one that I really think will be like, okay, wow, we really have entered the Jetsons age. And um, something like that will be good. But it's funny, you know, I look at my iPhone and I, it's such a wonder of technology. It's like I do everything on it from all the business stuff and, you know, and, uh, but we haven't really realized that. We haven't actually take, sat down and said, well, my li entire life is different or something cultural has completely changed the way we feel it it kind of came it's slowly built in and now it just everyone sort of takes it for granted even siri siri's a little bit scary sometimes mm -hmm. you can talk to your phone it talks back to you mm -hmm. um i when you talk about certain moments i don't know what there will be but i certainly hope there will be some that really awaken uh you know shock people out of their little um mm -hmm. delirium and just say uh whoa whoa we are we are really crossing some new uh some new boundaries here yeah, it's certainly yeah, it's certainly going to be a, an interesting future for people who have got their head in the sand. That's for sure. Yeah. Uh, but look, it's not guaranteed. There are scenarios that like halt our future progress. Like we, you know, there's the the threat of nuclear war. Um, there's a threat of like some sort of environmental issue. Um, you know, meteors or climate change. Uh, and there's a f the threat of like you put forward before, like some form of moratorium on certain technologies through either religious or some other dogmatic um, reasons. Wouldn't it? Um, yeah, that would be nasty, but like, um, yeah, how, how do you think to, what the best way is to avoid these sort of possible um, uh, showstoppers to advancement? Well, you know, in fact, I... I Again, one of the reasons I wrote the book was to try to present a, a scenario that I don't think anyone wants to happen. It would be great to have a transhuman-inspired world, but no one wants the best scientists in the world to be so ostracized that they have to leave and you know start a war. You know, so uh, I'm I'm hoping that people will talk about stuff like that and just talk about you know the, the idea. Of, I, I belong to the the Lifeboat Foundation, and I was recently uh, part of this. Uh, little group that dealt with NASA um, essentially trying to make sure that an asteroid, if an asteroid came, how can you stop it from, you know, destroying uh, life on planet Earth? And, uh, and it's fascinating because <clears throat> it's almost like a science fiction movie when you think about it. It's just a, like a game, but it's actually not a game, historically speaking. I mean, in, if you give a, a enough, you know, millions of years, you have a very high probability of something like that happening. And I don't think people take it really seriously, especially a, a planet that has $400 trillion of wealth or something. And I, I, um, I'm hoping more people will just uh, either make movies or just get freaked out about stuff like that and realize that it only takes one virus to completely decimate population. Yeah, yeah. And that and people have to be careful. And they have to, you know, 
they want to have the science in place before that stuff happens. And, you know, that just is, you know, it's hard to tell human beings to do that because they tend to just say, oh, wait till tomorrow to deal with, you know, potentialities. But um, I certainly am a, a person in general. I'm kind of paranoid. I'm, I'm kind of worried about everything. And, um, and I like to look around and examine everything all the time to make sure that I'm not missing anything and doing the, going on the, the most expedient path and whatever I'm trying to accomplish. And um, so uh, I wish more people did that because uh, I find that people are just so go lucky mm -hmm. and thinking that the world's going to be great. But reality is everyone's going to die unless somebody does something about it. And mm -hmm. eventually other bad things are going to happen to the planet as a whole. So it's, mm -hmm. it's well worth um, spending the money and time and resources on trying to make sure that we uh, can avoid all these things. Mm, yeah, so like, well, let's talk <clears throat> about then what individuals can do. Even with like, like we've already you already spoke about you know somebody d donated three percent of something, um, their income or something you know, that would make a big difference. But w w let's just say we have um, a, you know a broad variety of options: uni, um, joining transhumanist groups, um, blogging, media. Um, you know, getting rich and donating heaps of money. What What do you think are like some high impact pathways to making a big difference that's accessible to you know every to the average listener? I guess. Well, I, you know, I and ultimately, I I'm hoping that some of the very very rich people on the planet. Uh, I you know, I, one thing I'm literally looking forward to is when a lot of the young multi billionaires kind of get older because. What's happening is we have most of the real wealth is in the hands of very conservative older people who, who have their ideologies and their religion set in place. And honestly, it really doesn't, they, they're not going to be convinced anymore. It's like teaching an old dog uh, new tricks. It just, you know, it doesn't really happen. However, there's a whole group of people because of technology and that kind of wealth that's been created. And I'm hoping over time, more and more and more of them will be giving um, money to you know, basic life extension science like Calico that has been, you know, these kind of ideas where that kind of wealth will filter through the system and go directly to it. And I'm also hoping as they do it, governments will start to say, well, you know, that what, my book presents the idea that there's a lot of value in trying to uh, uh, determine how many life hours a country has based on its population. Life hours equal productive, productivity hours and stuff like that. Instead of thinking of human beings as, well, we're going to, you know, they live 30 years, they get their retirement, then they, in trying to see them more as potential vessels to be productive for an indefinite life, you know, spans and stuff like that. That's actually much more valuable from an economic, from a kind of a, uh, a progressive, uh, from a progress point of view uh, of any nation. And I, I wish governments would see that more. And I hope, you know, some of the media stuff coming out and maybe some of the other billionaires that will eventually give a lot more money to life extension um, will help to convince governments that instead of seeing us as this life cycle death machine, you know, we're just a bunch of death machines. Uh, just, okay, we're born, pay our taxes, and then die. <clears throat> They'll see us and say, wow, maybe we can always have growth. One person can be this indefinite and uh, uh, unlimited potential of uh, resources for a country or for the, the planet as a whole and go on indefinitely. We can never stop growing. And um, I think getting that out of the system, getting death, you know, just stopping to think about death as a part of the system would be really helpful. And then I bet we'd be able to find laws that slowly start making, a, you know, as I say, pro, more pro-transhuman, more longevity friendly. Let's emphasize things like that instead of, um, you know, emphasizing this, uh, you know, born taxes death type of cycle, which... Yeah, I know it's gone on for centuries, but it, you know, in the 21st century, it's not going to be the same anymore. Mm, definitely, it sounds a, uh, yeah, it sounds like a, a great way forward. Um, once we do get the cycle of politics in, interested in, in people's impetus to have technologies for life extension, yeah, there the a lot more lobbying will probably go on. Um, so. I guess like um, we are coming close to an hour. Is there anything that you would like to add that I haven't like? Is there any like a yeah? Well, do you have any conclusion comments and things like that? Well, I, I think my my basic takeaway from <clears throat> everything that I have uh, kind of seen in my year, really um, talking about my book and and 
and in being really, I guess, intimately involved in the transhuman community is that there's a lot of great people doing a lot of great things out there. But like you said in your last question, we really need to try to figure out methods that are actually more impactful than sharing amongst ourselves. Mm -hmm. And what I'm, this is one of the reasons that I actually reached out to some of these mainstream publications like the Huffington Post, Psychology Today, because uh, frankly, there's very few transhumanists out there. And in fact, most of the editors didn't even know it, you know. And um, I think as a community, we really need to say, okay, we've all talked to ourselves, at, you know, at, for, so, for so long already. Let's now go out and actually talk to the average layperson and just try to tell him or her or and take our media and really spread it out mm -hmm. and get a broader populace. Because I, I, I'm a firm believer that the more people that support life extension and longevity science, the more the governments will listen, the more culture will change, the more it'll be this big, slow turn of like a of a big, giant Titanic ship moving and saying, OK, now we're going the direction of indefinite lifespan. And that will be beneficial for society because so much commerce will be created because of it. So much um, just kind of lifestyle changes will be created about it. And it, it's not like, um, you know, an, a black and white decision for most people. It's going to be something slow, but it's, it's up to our little community to go out there and tell them, um, hey, this is happening. It, it's happening so quickly. Let's all do this together. And it's going to be for the benefit of uh, for, for all of us. Definitely, yeah. Well, I'm looking forward to that kind of future. Um, it's fabulous being talking to you, and um, I, I encourage everybody to read Sultan's book, who's who's listening here, and uh, you can get it from Amazon. Um, you can get it all over the place. The Transhumanist Wager. Awesome. Well, Ian, Adam, thanks for having me so much on your show. It's been great to talk to you. I really enjoyed it. Uh, yeah, no worries. Yeah. So everybody who's listened to us and who has enjoyed it, consider subscribing. <laughs> and uh, look, look forward to uh, the next.